Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Applying Principles of Biosafety in Laboratory Animal Facilities. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by the Andersons Lab Bedding Products. As the sole manufacturer of Beto Cobbs, the Andersons has provided the research community with the most trusted name in bedding since 1962. From irradiated and qualified products available in audioclavable and bulk bags to sterility and heavy metal testing, the Andersons provide a number of services to the industry. For more information, please visit www.andersonslabbedding.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your question through the Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jim Swearingen. Dr. Swearingen is the Comparative Medicine Veterinarian for the National Biodefense Analysis and Countermeasures Center and a former Senior Director of the Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. Internet. Dr. Swearingen received his veterinary medical degree from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and completed a four-year residency in laboratory animal medicine at Walter Reed Army Institute for Research in Washington, DC. I will now turn it over to Dr. Swearingen. Thank you, Brenda, uh, for that introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending today. But I'd especially like to thank the uh, organizers of the Bioconference Live <clears throat> series and staff who've uh, done their very best to ensure that, that uh, I'm appropriately trained and uh, minimize the opportunities for my uh, messing this up. So um, I, they've done a wonderful job and I want to thank them for all their assistance. <clears throat> I have uh, I'm very privileged to uh, uh, I feel very privileged to be here today and talk to you all uh, about uh, applying principles of biosafety in laboratory animal facilities. And um, <clears throat> as you heard, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've got uh, about 25 years of experience in, in working in infectious disease research. And one of the things that I've found in infectious disease research is uh, you look at the biosafety uh, guidelines a lot and you become very familiar with the principles that uh, that are espoused in the, not only the uh, biosafety and biomedical uh, uh, laboratories, um, microbiological laboratories, not only that kind of documentation, but in, in the textbooks and things too. And so I thought as I was putting this, uh, this presentation together is that, you know, there's a lot of those principles of uh, biosafety that apply in, in all aspects of laboratory animal facility, facilities, whether involved with uh, biohazards or not. And while this presentation will talk uh, a little bit about uh, the uh, biocontainment and those types of hazards, it's, it's really going to focus on how those principles can be applied to laboratory animal facilities in general. And I think there's a lot of things we can uh, we can learn from uh, those approaches in the biosafety industry. So with that, just to give you an overview of the of the presentation, um, uh, one of the principles that uh, I've uh, learned to appreciate significantly is hazard identification. And uh, in my early days in this field, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm not sure we did a real good job with this, and I think we're coming around and starting to do a much better job, but I think that's one of those principles we can apply in all animal facilities. Uh, secondly, we'll talk about approaches to risk assessment, and while many people think about one particular uh, application of risk assessment, I'm going to 
try to talk to you about uh, 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 multiple approaches uh, and way risk assessment can be applied to animal facilities. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some laboratory practices and techniques and some things that I've seen and and <clears throat> have uh, used over the years um, just to share some of those things that I think are uh, have made significant differences in uh, both safety and biosafety in laboratory animal facilities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about safety equipment and uh, some of the issues with those. And then at the end, uh, we'll just kind of do a quick review of uh, the principle of facility design and construction and it applies to um, ABSL2 and ABSL3 facilities just to kind of give an overview of uh, what some of the requirements are out there. Uh, and some of the standards and, and guidelines. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. And we'll talk about uh, first uh, um, some of the keys to effectively identifying hazards that I think uh, have been useful, um, not only in my career, but I've seen others implement them uh, as, as well. Um, and probably the biggest thing up front is uh, making sure that who's ever conducting the hazard identification uh, really has the experience and qualifications to pick up and identify the, the dangers and the hazards that are there. A lot of times in animal facility that falls to the veterinarian. And um, as a veterinarian, I'm very aware of many of the hazards associated with using animals, but uh, I'm not an expert in some of the other types of uh, hazards that uh, others may be able to pick up with uh, different types of training and, and experiences. Uh, one of the other ways to help identify hazards is uh, making sure they're highlighted specifically in animal use protocols and that safety issues are, are reviewed by the appropriate individuals uh, that can, as, as I said, you know, adequately and, uh, routine and be able to effectively identify those uh, issues. Um, probably one of the uh, most effective ways, in my opinion, uh, that I think helps with hazard identification is having regularly scheduled walkthrough reviews of the animal facilities uh, by environmental health and safety professionals. As I said, veterinarians and uh, veterinary staff may be very familiar with certain hazards but may not be able to pick up some of those things that uh, are, uh, are uh, not quite so familiar to us. So uh, the review of uh, institutional job safety data is another area that uh, a lot of people may forget about uh, when it comes to the animal facility. Um, they may think about that for things like their physical plant workers or um, uh, something like that, but not so much for the uh, uh, animal facility. And so, you know, looking through OSHA logs or if you use near miss reports, that kind of data can be very useful in looking for trends or uh, looking for things that uh, may be easy fixes or, or trends that may need to be addressed in a, in a more uh, in-depth manner. So I think uh, all those things are, are really important when you're looking to be able to effectively identify hazards. When you do the uh, walkthrough review that I talked about earlier, um, I think uh, that is, it's not just highlighted um, in, uh, in the biosafety literature, but there's also a document called Occupational Health and Safety in the Care and Use of Research Animals pub uh, published by the National Research Council, which can be a, a great resource. And it talks uh, about this particular issue as well. Um, to involve your uh, environmental health and safety professionals in hazard identification control and that it can enhance the involvement, uh, you know, uh, can be enhanced by the involvement of animal care and research personnel. Uh, conducting reviews when work and research is in progress is uh, obviously important. Uh, it's much different walking through a facility that's uh, maybe shut down for the afternoon versus in the morning when things are at uh, full peak. So determining when to uh, go in and uh, do your evaluations can be important as well. And I think it's really important in this aspect of hazard identification to talk to uh, the, the people that are doing the work every day and to get their opinions. Um, uh, I, I know some places uh, that have uh, taken this to the level of including 
uh, an evaluation goal uh, to recommend at least one safety improvement uh, during the year. And, uh, and, and it may, and I think, I think that may be a good idea or at least have some sort of safety goal to get them thinking about uh, ways they can improve something. And, uh, you know, it could be as something as small as, you know, how to better remove your PPE when you're uh, leaving an animal area or maybe how to more safely mix sanitizing chem chemicals. Um, and I think uh, just having them continue to think about that, get their opinions, involve them is, is important uh, because they're the ones who really are gonna know uh, where those hidden hazards lie that may not be readily apparent uh, during a routine walkthrough. So let's talk a little bit about uh, experimental hazards. Uh, there's a couple, there's different types of hazards, obviously. Um, I kind of like to break them down just for my own edification into experimental and non-experimental hazards. Kind of helps me just uh, uh, be able to look in a different way at them rather than trying to uh, look at everything together. And when you're talking about experimental hazards, you're really looking at uh, Things like chemical agents, we talked about uh, things that may be uh, used in everyday cleaning and uh, chemicals uh, in, in the uh, in everyday husbandry that may occur. Uh, but there's also things associated with, um, um, uh, with studies themselves, the experiment that's going on, such as uh, if you're using volatile anesthetics uh, as part of the study or carcinogens or toxins, obviously biological agents, um, you know, there, you, there's a lot of aspects you have to look at the agent uh, to include not only virulence, pathogenicity, and how it's transmitted, uh, but also how it's transmitted in the animals. A lot of times it's transmitted differently in animals than it is in people. And uh, I think that's uh, important to uh, be able to uh, look at it to that level. Um, things like ionizing radiation, radiation, if you're using x-ray machines uh, as part of a study, radioactive compounds, and also looking at the zoonotic potential of the species being used in the study. And you can see on the slide a list of uh, several different uh, concerns that might come up, whether you're using sheep or non-human primates. Um, uh, especially if you start looking at wild-caught rodents, uh, you might want to consider, you know, uh, have they been tested for hantavirus or if not, what protections are you using? Prairie dogs um, uh, can obviously uh, carry plague. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can look at um, from, uh, from, uh, a res from a hazard standpoint with, uh, with using animals, um, both ex associated with the experiment or um, and all these could be as part of an experiment, or some of them could be non-experimental hazards as well, just as uh, natural um, diseases of animals that uh, you want to consider. Um, kind of when I look at non-experimental hazards, I kind of think about the more mechanical type things, uh, bites, scratches, kicks, which we all know can happen with, uh, can occur when working with animals. The use of sharps, sharps or cleaning chemicals, uh, pressurized containers, uh, you know, pressurized gas cylinders. I'll talk a little bit about the, that a little later on and give you uh, um, uh, an example of a way we tried to reduce that risk uh, of using pressurized uh, uh, gas cylinders. Um, if you're using um, fish or in your cage wash area where you have areas with high moisture content, uh, lots of water, um, you, that uh, there's uh, certainly risks uh, with uh, electricity being, because all those things, uh, all those areas have outlets and uh, many times there's extension cords and uh, things like that that you uh, want to make sure uh, you don't uh, uh, present an elect, uh, electrocution risk to either animals or people. Um, ergonomic, uh, you know, sometimes we forget that uh, the type of work uh, that happens in an animal facility can have significant ergonomic repercussions, such as repetitive motion of changing cages, uh, cleaning cages, handling animals, uh, lifting. Uh, many times there's significant lifting requirements in an animal facility as well. Of course, machinery, rack washers, uh, probably one of the biggest hazards, uh, significant hazards within an animal facility being trapped inside a rack washer. <clears throat> you know, looking at that as a hazard is, requires a, a close look and there's a, a number of uh, significant steps uh, you can take to minimize those risks as well. 
um, noise hazards. We work in the animal facilities. There's a lot of machinery, uh, uh, the rack washers themselves, the animals themselves, uh, things like that can present noise hazards as well. And then, of course, we can't forget the old slip trip hazards that uh, we certainly want to be aware of and be looking for in an animal facility. So now we've kind of talked a little bit about risk assessment. Um, let's move on to uh, risk <coughs> uh, assessment. And uh, there, this quote out of the Occupational Health and Safety uh, and Care and Use of Research Animals that I mentioned a little bit earlier um, gives a nice quote where it says, risk is a measure of the likelihood of a consequence, whereas hazard is the inherent danger in a material system. So we kind of talked a little bit about the hazard portion. So let's kind of move on and talk uh, about uh, the risk assessment uh, aspect and how risk assessment in general can be applied to, uh, to an animal facility. Um, so let's talk about the next step in, in risk assessment. Um, this kind of goes back to some of the same principles you saw in hazard identification in that you may have to make sure people are knowledgeable of the risk and procedures and management before they can uh, do an appropriate risk assessment. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about that as we continue to move along. Determining the importance of a hazard is, uh, is very important as well. Um, there's a lot of um, considerations when you're doing that. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of them there that all can have an impact on uh, the importance of a hazard. Not all hazards are created equal. Um, and then once you, uh, you know, have those hazards, the part of the risk assessment process toward, as you've uh, assessed the risk and determined the level of risk is to develop uh, mitigation strategies and not only implement them, but make sure your workforce is trained. I would like to just uh, uh, interject a, a comment here uh, when we're talking about effective risk assessment and determining the importance of a hazard is there's another R I like to throw in with risk assessment and that's risk assessment and that's called reason. Uh, I think it's important to use reason and risk assessment together. Uh, just a, an example um, that I had uh, heard about recently was um, in, in uh, a certain place uh, there are certain activities that require required uh, using two pairs of gloves and uh, uh, you know uh, the old adage if two is good more is better uh, came back with well then you know if, if we need two then we might need three that would be even better um, as it was implemented they realized there was significant issues with uh, dex loss of dexterity and uh, increase the risk of, uh, of accidents from uh, other reasons, dropping things, not being able to adequately manipulate things to the uh, level that they needed to. So again, I think uh, it's really important as we're talking about this that uh, all of these uh, aspects of risk assessment have to be considered together along with uh, reasonableness. So, um, when we're talking about risk assessment, again, you know, things that I uh, like to do to kind of, I guess I'm a splitter rather than a lumper, is to look at, uh, I look at risk from both a job category perspective and an individual risk uh, perspective. And as you can see from the cartoon there, that, uh, you know, these are good examples of high consequence but low probability uh, events. And again, this comes back to that reasonableness that I talked about earlier, is you really have to look at the uh, risk as a whole, at the hazard as a whole, and do a really comprehensive risk assessment to, uh, to come up with a reasonable solution. <coughs> so let's look first at job category risk assessment. Um, as you can see here, uh, in a in an animal facility, you may have a wide variety of uh, uh, quote unquote job categories or activities. And while each of these categories present uh, maybe different uh, uh, physical risks, uh, and they certainly present different levels of risk. Um, uh, some of the hazards we talked about earlier uh, working at, near rack washers may apply to animal caregivers and cage wash attendants, but may certainly may not apply to investigators or uh, visiting scientists or summer students. 
um, <clears throat> IACUC members, uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee members who may be uh, evaluating animal facilities once every six months aren't going to have the same level and intensity of exposure as an animal technician uh, or maybe an animal caregiver. So again, um, while we have different job categories, we have to understand that they all present different levels of risk as well. So if you look at individual risk assessment uh, rather than job category risk assess assessment, this is where we really get into the more um, uh, medical aspects of, uh, of the risk assessment process. <clears throat> and uh, nearly all the, the guidance you see out on, the, on, on this perspective talks about the need to include the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, talks about the need for having uh, qualified health professionals being involved with uh, the occupational health and safety program. Um, and it's really important that they have the knowledge of the risks uh, associated with the animal uh, care and use program as well. And that may take a little bit of education. Um, but it's very important that that's done. Um, the medical evaluation really should occur at, at or near the time of employment, uh, but certainly the idea is that it occurs prior to animal exposure. Um, and then, of course, uh, you always have to take into account the confidentiality regulations when you're developing this type of uh, program, a medical evaluation program, as part of the individual risk assessment. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to throw a couple other types of risk assessments out uh, uh, at you that I, I think uh, I found is valuable in my career <clears throat> um, for a number of reasons. But, um, you know, one of the things that uh, a lot of us may struggle with, especially in working in the infectious disease arena, is immunizations. And uh, just like anything else, vaccination should be... Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the guidance that's out there, uh, it talks about pre-exposure immunization should be offered to personnel with risk of infection or exposure. Um, uh, you know, a good example of that is tetanus, which is highly recommended for animal care personnel uh, and vaccination against rabies for people working with animals capable of transmitting the virus. So those are kind of, you know, kind of straightforward uh, recommendations that you'll see out there where it gets a little bit dicier and where I think the risk assessment really becomes um, uh, more, um, really a, a more serious issue is um, uh, for those who are, may need back, who may um, uh, be considering vaccination with experimental uh, vaccines or infectious uh, IND vaccines. Sometimes they're they're called. Um, um, uh, and and these types of vaccines, uh, if you're looking at those, I think it's really important that part of the risk assessment process not only be thorough but also uh, weighs both the benefit of the vaccination versus potential harm. Some of these. Uh, um, IND vaccines uh, can have potential significant side effects, and I think it's really important that those be uh, be evaluated uh, uh, um, appropriately from both sides. Um, specific recommendations can be found in the uh, you know biosafety, microbiological, and biomedical laboratories, or the BMVLs I mentioned earlier, um, with regard to uh, some of these. Uh, 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 IND vaccines um, and uh, and can be very useful. Uh, CDC website also has a lot of really good information on these types of vaccines as well. So all that uh, really needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and some places I know have actual uh, committees that look at this and make determinations uh, based on on uh, a risk assessment process. The other uh, type of risk assessment that I, I am a, a real avid supporter of is a day, what I <clears throat> like to call a daily risk assessment. And this kind of came about um, with, uh, as you know, as you people who work with animals and work with hazards realize that the animals themselves can present new hazards uh, that can change on a daily basis. And uh, you know, I'll uh, I think. Uh, some of the reasons that doing a daily risk assessment and how it might be done um, can be, uh, and how it can be done, we'll talk about here, but I think it can be very useful. Um, probably 
the first step in in doing this is just meeting prior to going into uh, into animal areas or in uh, if you're using hazard stage and into containment areas, <clears throat> and to really just to sit down, take a few minutes to discuss the day's activities and what everybody's roles are, um, but also to identify any new hazards. Uh, and one of the things we found is that in infectious disease research, you know, animals' dispositions can change from uh, not only day to day, but actually, you know, from hour to hour. But, uh, you know, many times on a daily basis, you'll start to see changes. Um, animals, um, if they're not feeling well, can become guarded and uh, any, uh, and, uh, and can present uh, and become aggressive and present new hazards from that perspective. So um, uh, when people see changes, if you're not uh, relaying that information, communicating well, that can present an unknown hazard. So sitting down on a daily basis, going through, talking about the uh, the new has what you're going to be doing, any new hazards that are being introduced or changes in disposition can help you uh, develop a mitigation plan right there that morning uh, for any identified hazards. And uh, I, I think it's a, a very useful activity that can pay dividends. And it's a cultural activity because it's, it's not a, a set time on your Outlook calendar. It's just something everybody has to be uh, used to doing to be able to sit down and do it just without thought that this was going to happen. So you really have to embed it into the culture to make it useful. But uh, in my in my experience, uh, I found it to be very useful. Um, now we're going to kind of move on back into the medical uh, realm again, uh, looking at medical evaluations as part of the uh, program, uh, medical surveillance program. I'm not going to talk a lot about these particular issues or these different types of medical evaluations. If anybody's really interested, you can go to the referencing at the bottom of the slide there that I've mentioned two or three times already. Um, but just briefly to review, you know, we talked about the importance of pre-placement um, medical evaluations as part of the personal risk assessment uh, that uh, needs to be considered. Um, periodic, uh, again, depends on the risks that are there. Some places may do annual, some may do every two years, and again, it really needs to do it be risk-based depending on the needs of, uh, of the program. Episodic is typically when there's a potential exposure or exposure, and that's uh, kind of a, your typical follow-up uh, to that kind of uh, episode. And then exit evaluations are really uncommon. Um, there's uh, a lot of issues associated with that, and while uh, there are some places where that occurs, it's it's not a it's not a, a common activity in, in most programs. So let's look at uh, change uh, kind of change gears here a little bit. We've talked about the uh, hazard identification and risk assess risk assessment aspects of uh, of uh, applying those principles to an animal program. And now I'd like to talk a little bit of applying the principle of laboratory practices and techniques to an animal program as well. So um, one of the things that uh, you see in uh, the BMBL the book that you see there on the slide, they talk about evaluating uh, a variety of things to include technical proficiency. And I think it's important because uh, sometimes these terms go by us and we think, oh, technical proficiency, okay, we've got to make sure people are trained. And I think it, uh, you need to read a little bit more into it than, than just training. Uh, technical proficiency is really more than just training. It's, uh, it implies that they have dem they demonstrated the ability to complete a task effectively and safely on a continuous basis. Uh, some may call it competency, uh, there's different, uh, you hear different names of it in the industry. But I think uh, we have to understand that when we're talking technical proficiency, that's the, the level that we're talking about here. Uh, and these types of things, this proficiency or competency, uh, includes, uh, you know, not handling each uh, species of animal, as we all know. As I've said many times, or said at least a couple times, all animals aren't created equal. And so, you know, it's important that uh, uh, they have the appropriate proficiency for each species. Um, any experimental procedures that may be being performed. Uh, but also in this arena, it's not just with the animals. Sometimes those samples are then also uh, taken and processed. 
um, uh, if they're collecting samples. And so they also have to have uh, the ability to handle uh, those samples with good microbiological practices, sterile technique in, in some cases, and uh, you know how to use equipment that uh, may not be a, um, a normal part of a, of, of a, a non-containment animal facility such as, you know, biological safety cabinets. So, you know, uh, that technical proficiency can extend out beyond just the animal handling and procedures. Also need to evaluate uh, when you're looking at people and evaluating them, evaluate their experience and uh, as well as the type of traits they have. And this one's a little bit more subjective, but I would say no less important is uh, looking at people, you know, how, how attentive they are when they're being given instruction, um, uh, how, what level of caution they tend to, uh, to apply, their ability to respond to emergencies. Uh, do you evaluate them regularly on that? Uh, sometimes it's a good uh, idea just to pop in and, and ask someone, okay, uh, this just happened, what are you gonna do? And, uh, and test them on their, their ability to respond to emergencies because uh, issues that, uh, or things that aren't used frequently need uh, a little bit more reminding and uh, maybe refresher training uh, than others. Accountability, that's, that's really a big one as well. Uh, do you see people being accountable for their actions if they make a mistake? Um, are they, do they own up it, to it or is their first response to point a finger and blame someone else? You know, while these are, uh, again, as I said, subjective, they're important traits that, uh, that people, uh, that you need to evaluate in people as well as concern for other safety. Do they think of others first? Are they making sure and being proactive about helping others uh, be safe as well and correcting others when uh, something may not be done quite right? And th those are all traits that we hope we can see in, in all our staff and, uh, and everyone working in, in animal facilities or laboratories. And I think it's it's good that you know if you look at all these things, those should also be part of the individual risk assessment process as well. So um, kind of lump those back into some of the previous things we were talking about as far as the risk assessment process. Um, I think they're all important traits that uh, that need evaluation. So let's look a little bit um, about uh, um, informed workers. You know, we, it's, as I mentioned, you should be able to go in and ask them uh, about the hazards of their job and you should be able to explain them and how, uh, how they uh, mitigate those hazards. Uh, you need to check to make sure they're proficient in implementing those safeguards. And consistency um, is probably one of the biggest issues. Um, that I think everyone struggles with, and that just comes through constant reminder, constant monitoring, and um, an evaluation of some of those things that we talked about just a little bit before. Um, the uh, uh, the ability to usually follow SOPs and policies is probably one of the, if we can attain that, we've made a big steps uh, towards working safely in animal facilities. Um, and uh, it's but probably one of the hardest things uh, to do as well. So I'm gonna just share with you a few uh, thoughts that I had that I thought were kind of uh, good examples of how you can implement safe laboratory practices and techniques um, uh, that can make a bit small things that uh, I think can make a big difference. Um, one of the things that um, I really try to harp on is placement of sharps containers. Um, a lot of times uh, people start procedures, uh, have a needle, a syringe, a needle in their hand, and then start looking around for a sharps container. And I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, probably seen that as well. Uh, one of the things I really emphasize in, in training and, and proficiency uh, evaluations are where that sharps container is placed. Um, you know, is it near the work site? Um, the other thing, and it's not just having it nearby, it's also making a, um, uh, an assessment of, you know, is it going, is, is the placement nearby also avoiding crossing of arms and hands? Or if there's people sharing one, are you avoiding the, uh, the chance that somebody's gonna reach over somebody else's arm? So placement um, can uh, be more than just nearby, and I think that's uh, really important. Um, one of the other things that uh, I think 
I feel, and I know there is probably uh, different opinions on this, but um, I feel the needle safety systems have made a big difference. Um, there's a whole variety of uh, needle safety systems. If you look at um, the uh, center of the slide um, uh, towards the top, uh, you can see, uh, let's see if I can make this work here. Uh, you can see this here, which is the uh, retractable. Uh, so as soon as the plunger is uh, fully depressed, the needle retracts up inside the needle. Uh, they have the covering type here, where uh, you manually push a shield over the top of the needle when you're when you're done. Uh, there and there's probably a dozen different types of systems out there, but uh, um, I think um, uh, you just need to look and see which ones might be uh, might be uh, uh, a good addition to your program uh, and again they're they're not for all circumstances at all times but uh, at least in my experience I think they've uh, made a significant difference. Um, one of the other things with regards to implement, implementing safe laboratory practices is one of the things I've seen in some places being introduced and a little bit more and more which I'm glad of is positive reinforcement behavioral training and I've got a couple pictures here through our walk with you but um, in, in this picture right here um, you can see uh, a sheep and a head stanchion and in this particular case what you can't see is up here is this gentleman right here is um, holding a marshmallow up uh, for this sheep who has voluntarily put their head in the gate and is having a marshmallow, a little amyl cream was provided here for some topical anesthesia and it's having blood drawn without any um, uh, notice that it's even being done. This is, uh, you know, this not only improves uh, science, the animals are less stressed, uh, safety, uh, they're not struggling and trying to fight the restraint system, uh, but also animal welfare improves that uh, um, bond that improves the relationship between the people and the animals themselves and uh, I think overall um, improves safety as well. The pictures on the right you can see here, um, the first one, uh, in this case uh, they took a laser pointer and this was from a um, uh, poster that I uh, uh, came across recently and they've used a pointer to train uh, non-human primates to, text, uh, to test their water exit and not only test it but to also take a drink um, and, uh, and again this is something that uh, a lot of places uh, have uh, and I remember back in the day uh, you know you put your arm in here and test the water exit for them that's certainly uh, not um, a good idea. Uh, others use uh, stainless steel poles to go in and touch the lixit. Um, again, that many times can stress out the animal. Uh, the animal can grab the pole. So again, this particular thing in about 10 minutes a day for about two weeks, uh, you can teach an animal to test their own water lixit. And so these are just a couple examples of how you can use different um, uh, different things that you may not think be are related to laboratory safety but are very useful. You can apply them in a way that improves not only animal welfare but uh, worker safety as well. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, compressed air, compressed gas cylinders before and uh, as anybody who knows who's worked with uh, compressed oxygen or compressed CO2, um, you know if these things fall and uh, you know uh, damage uh, the top they can go through um, uh, brick they can go through concrete walls they can here's an example right here of one that uh, went through a wall uh, that got away and uh, and especially if you're working in a hazardous environment moving um, these types of things in and out of a facility um, into a, into a hazardous area uh, can uh, cause a little bit of trepidation and so um, uh, something to consider is using um, uh, oxygen concentrators which is uh, right here and um, uh, I think uh, these you, the, the, you see a little if I point to it right there you can see a little e tank there but that's really just for backup um, that, uh, unless you have a power outage that e tank never has to be changed out 
and uh, you know where someone may have to change out e tanks uh, on a weekly basis, uh, you may go years without ever having to change this e tank, and so uh, you don't have to move um, uh, compressed gas cylinders in and out of your uh, um, surgery area or in out in and out of your animal facility or in and out of uh, biocontainment areas. And these compressed gas uh, or these uh, oxygen concentrators um, uh, have you know I've, I've used them; they work great. And uh, just, uh, or I think, a real improvement in, in uh, safety without having to deal with uh, co constantly moving uh, compressed gas cylinders in and out of facility. It, that is, if you don't have, uh, you know, inline uh, O2 or C, you know, uh, to your uh, to your facilities, um, this can be a, a very helpful. Uh, safety equipment. Um, some examples. I just want to talk uh, about the concept of primary barriers. Um, in most of the guidance that you look at out there, it talks about the use of primary barriers based on should be used based on risk assessment. And as you can see down at the bottom, there's uh, several different types of uh, primary containment devices, as well as uh, uh, up towards the top here and here. Um, you know, biosafety cabinets, centrifuge cups are, are examples of, on a smaller scale, of uh, primary barriers. Uh, primary containment for animals, you can see down here several, uh, at least right here, you can see several different types. We've got rodent, uh, rabbit, non-human primary, primary containment caging, uh, downdraft tables over here. Um, they also make portable downdraft tables now. Um, and it, it's important to remember that um, uh, these primary barriers can include not just the equipment, but also uh, techniques that guard against the release of, of uh, hazardous or biological materials in general, and they provide that extra barrier between the worker and the environment. Um, engineering controls um, uh, are, you know, provide engineering controls like are provided by the primary containment devices that, that I mentioned here. Uh, really should be considered first before relying solely on PPE for protecting uh, uh, personnel. And uh, th while that's spelled, uh, recommended in a number of places, the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals also makes a specific point of, of talking about the use of uh, primary barriers uh, uh, first uh, versus uh, trying to use PPE as your, as your first line of defense. A good example of that is uh, allergens. Uh, in animal facilities, uh, rather than putting somebody in a um, uh, N95 uh, with a bedding dump station that pulls the dust and allergens away from the person, be more preferable. So, just some examples of, of or an example of uh, where primary containment or primary barriers uh, uh, and engineering controls should be used uh, first. Some of the most common uh, biosafety cabinet mistakes. Um, that you'll see out there, and again, any of you who use these uh, are, are well aware of those. Uh, probably the biggest mistake is putting them in the wrong location where there's uh, room air currents that uh, come from doors being opened uh, and closed uh, during the day as people walk by, traffic. All those air currents can disrupt the cabinet, um, uh, you know, uh, raising the sash too high, disabling the alarm so you can raise the sash too high. Uh, crowding work surfaces uh, in block, which can also block the directional airflow, and just poor technique, not you know, uh, decontaminating hands, things like that before they come out. So again, these are probably some of the more common things that we can look at uh, when we're evaluating uh, how people work to ensure that these are used as they're designed to to be used. Uh, safety equipment. Um, we talked about PPE, kind of being that last line of defense. Um, yeah, there's several different types of PPE listed there. I did want to mention just a couple things that I've come across uh, in, uh, uh, in my career. Um, this picture on the left right here is um, a new, uh, it's the first time I've seen this. It's a uh, rabbit cage with built-in uh, uh, restraint mechanism. And I don't know if you can see in the slide, there's kind of a hashed uh, stainless steel panel in the back. And it's designed a lot like a non-human primate cage where you can pull the rabbit to the front of the cage um, if you need to uh, uh, access them for maybe to uh, chemically restrain them or something like that without actually having to pull the animal out and hold it to, to, uh, to make the injection. So I think that's a nice step forward. 
in those cases where you might need something like that, where safety equipment can uh, be a value added. Uh, the picture on the right here, um, these Ke uh, Kevlar gauntlets here, um, in, a, in a previous uh, position, um, uh, we were starting to have issues with uh, rabbits who would um, uh, scratch through the lab coats or the scrubs uh, and uh, we noticed that the biggest majority of those occurred on on the back of the hands and the forearms and using these Kevlar gauntlets is uh, at that uh, at the other place really made a big difference in reducing uh, 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 injuries from from as we all know the rabbits have uh, very powerful back legs um, just one uh, little uh, word of, of uh, of caution with the Kevlar gauntlets is if you use them in, in containment and use bleach as your uh, primary for prime your primary uh, uh, disinfectant de for decontamination um, these things melt like butter um, when bleach get on them uh, it's just a, a reaction that breaks down the material and uh, they'll uh, fall apart on you pretty quickly so just a little thought there if you ever decide to use them to uh, that you know that ahead of time before you buy them uh, secondary barriers or facility design and construction, um, uh, as we all know that uh, if you look at the BMBL again, uh, it talks about how, it how facility design really does uh, contribute to not only worker protection, but also to protect uh, persons outside the lab, laboratory or animal area, um, also the community and um, the level of barriers depends a lot on the risk of transmission and there's uh, some examples included down below there that talk about uh, you know you have to decide based on your risk do you need specialized ventilation systems uh, air treatment systems controlled access and physical separation <clears throat> and I have um, I have several slides um, that uh, um, that kind of go through uh, really some of the uh, uh, facility design considerations for ABSL and ABSL2 and, and not so much focused on just the um, uh, conventional animal facility. And uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, I know we're kind of approaching uh, about 10, uh, 10, 12 minutes out. Um, uh, I'll try to go through these fairly quickly because I'd like to have, make sure we have, uh, uh, ten, you know, five or ten minutes at the end, or maybe more, to um, uh, answer any questions that uh, may be coming along. So uh, I'll, I'll really just kind of hit the highlighted area in these slides to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, the area, the, um, the, uh, uh, on the slides, the words that you see that are um, uh, in in more of a um, red maroon color are uh, things that when I first went through the fifth edition of the BMBL when it came out were um, a little bit different or, or maybe there was an emphasis on it um, and so those are the things we'll kind of focus on that uh, like say a, a new emphasis or a little different from the fourth edition of the BMBL and while the fifth edition has been out a while um, you know sometimes uh, uh, some of us uh, who've been doing this a while, we forget that uh, as new additions come out, uh, we we tend to think about the old version rather than the new one. So uh, while I know it's been out a little while, we'll just go through and highlight those very quickly. So if you look at ABSL2 facilities, um, uh, in addition to your typical restricted access that uh, the BMBL talks about, uh, it talks about having secured and locked external doors, um, your animal room door issues pretty much stay the same. Animal room ventilation, they did uh, focus a little bit more on making sure it emphasized inward airflow and negative pressure to adjoining hallways. And they also talk about having an autoclave in the animal facility as the wording they particularly use. So for those of you looking at uh, uh, maybe renovating or designing uh, animal facilities, the BMBL provides a lot of guidance uh, with regards to what their expect, what its expectations are. Uh, regarding uh, animal facilities. Um, the uh, kind of the key point, one of the changes here in this particular slide, and uh, you can read that as, as, as I'm talking here, but um, it, one of the changes talks about recommending having a mechanical uh, washer for cages um, uh, in, 
maybe not specifically inside BSL2, ABSL2, but having it available um, as, uh, uh, as a recommendation for cleaning cages. Um, these are all pretty straightforward, and, and I like to call these uh, this particular slide thing terms like sealed penetration, slip resistant floors. Um, uh, I kind of like to call those uh, the um, uh, performance standard uh, uh, criteria, which doesn't tell you how to seal the penetrations, doesn't tell you what floor type to use to be, to be slip resistant, but just states that that's what that's the the engineer or the performance criteria that needs to be attained when you're building uh, these facilities or uh, renovating them. Um, these are all pretty straightforward too, um, uh, and uh, kind of just reemphasizes, you know, that they talk about having an autoclave in the facility for decontamination and so forth. So all pretty standard things. Um, it uh, talks about methods of decontamination uh, and also that uh, those procedures uh, should be validated uh, at appropriate intervals. Um, it doesn't tell you what that interval should be, but uh, uh, in, implies that it should be on a regular basis. Um, and you have, as you can see down at the bottom, lots of different mechanisms, everything, uh, you know, simple. Uh, to more complex, uh, you know, uh, biological indicators, buoy dick packs, things like that. So there's a lot of uh, different ways uh, you can uh, evaluate those, uh, uh, your, uh, your autoclaves, but uh, it does need to be done on a regular basis. For ABSL2 under uh, ventilation, um, uh, pretty much straightforward is what we've talked about, inward, uh, negative pressure, um, no recirculation uh, and so forth. So uh, pretty straightforward stuff there. Um, when you start moving into ABSL3, um, you, you have to take ABSL1 and add ABSL2 and then add ABSL3. It's, uh, they build upon each other and uh, that's made pretty clear uh, in, the, um, uh, in the BMBL that uh, that's how these requirements work. So uh, if you look at facilities, um, uh, pretty it looks a lot like ABSL2. Um, talks a little bit more about security as far as it being separated from other areas and access restrictions and things like that. Uh, so it starts to get a little more uh, detailed on some of these things. Um, and it also talks about uh, uh, adding additional uh, protections, uh, you know, whether it's showers or HEPA filtration. Uh, effluent decontamination. And again, these, it, it's very clear in indicating that all these additional environmental protections should be determined by risk assessment of the particular site. And of course, always uh, applicable full uh, federal, state, or local regulations. Um, the uh, operation of the facility has to be documented and tested to verify how it works like it's supposed to work and re-verified annually. So that's something that in the three that you don't see in the four. And uh, here's some of the highlights just to kind of summarize a little bit. Uh, some of those things we've talked about. Uh, it also starts talking now about double door entry, that the autoclave is convenient to animal rooms, not just in the facility. Um, and so again, things start to become a, a little more, a uh, uh, little more discreet. So hands-free or automatic washing sinks, and I, th I think this is important too because um, while I think a lot of us struggle uh, with this having uh, you know, sinks in the hand sink, hand washing sinks in the animal room, and how to use them, um, you know, it does say that you know hand washing procedures should preclude contamination of personnel or breach in room containment barriers. So um, you know the location is important of the sinks as well. They should be out by the doors, not in the back of the room. Um, and those procedures for using that sink need to be well thought out because the last thing you want to do is try to be doing the right thing and then making things worse. We've already talked about biosafety cabinets a little bit, so I won't get on with those. Um, and then uh, a little bit more on ventilation uh, that kind of repeats a little bit what we talked about earlier. Um, and uh, with ABSL3, they talk about mechanical washer required versus recommended, and uh, some other things that we've kind of already touched on. 
Uh, and just so we have some room for questions, I'm going to skip this last slide. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward, and uh, again, a lot of this you can take right out of the BMBL. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, open it up for questions, and um, uh, and so we can uh, give a little bit of time for you all to uh, ask anything you'd like to ask. So, Brenda, I'm going to pass it, or should I pass it over to you? Oh, wait a second. I'm sorry. Um, I have some questions here. Um, uh, here's a question. Um, it says, do you consider a risk factor uh, the number of hours that people work in uh, rodent animal facilities uh, um, uh, during the day. Um, and uh, I, my answer to that would be yes. Um, I think one of the things that um, uh, that is probably under uh, under evaluated is fatigue. And uh, I think, uh, again, that's becoming more and more prominent in the risk assessment uh, arena. Um, I think fatigue has to be taken into consideration. Um, how many hours a day, how many times they do a repeated motion, um, as, especially in, in containment uh, or in non-containment and just regular animal facilities, I think fatigue has to be uh, uh, a, a very important part of that consideration and uh, especially in some places overtime is used a lot and um, uh, and uh, you know we kind of you kind of got to watch that too because too much overtime I know people like overtime but it can also uh, have uh, adverse effects as well so I'm gonna go to another question it says uh, let's see for chemical hazards well known that just about anything can become toxic with high enough exposure, how do you create a list of hazardous chemicals to be monitored at your facility? Do you assess the level of hazard depending on the quantity of exposure, even for mutagenic or teratogenic agents? Um, to, uh, I think, um, and, and that's a great question because that's, I think, something we all struggle with. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen done is, um, is uh, have a centralized um, clearinghouse uh, through the safety office for, for uh, hazardous chemicals in that um, any hazardous chemical that, uh, or any chemical basically, um, that comes in the facility, uh, at least in places I've seen, uh, has to go through the safety office for review, for th to look at things just like you talked about, you know, mutagenic, ter teratogenic, how it's gonna be used, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, uh, uh, anti, you know, even um, even um, um, drugs, uh, you know, a lot of the drugs used for uh, cancer research. So, you know, I uh, I think a good way to do that is uh, have a, uh, and, and that can be built into the ordering system. I know that can be a little uh, um, maybe frustrating for people um, if you don't have a good ordering system, um, but at least have a clearinghouse through your um, health and safety office so people who are familiar with those types of hazards can evaluate them and determine what those risks are, um, as well as being really good about making sure you update your um, MSDSs uh, in the area so people are aware, have access to those as well. Um, Let's see, uh, here's a question. Uh, who makes the rabbit cages with built-in restraint mechanisms that you showed? Um, I believe, uh, you know, I, again, I'm not here to, to uh, advertise for anybody, um, but I, I believe that's Allentown that makes those. Um, I'm not sure they're uh, on their website. It may be you want to call them and, and talk to them about that. And if they tell you I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's who, has, uh, who is making those. Uh, it's at least the only place I know of right now that's making them. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, here's a question here. What's your advice for dealing with EHS groups that are overly risk averse? Um, and boy, that's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, again, it kind of comes back to that argument of putting that uh, second R in risk assessment, uh, you know, reason. Um, 
And while, you know, uh, I, I realize not everybody is reasonable, I think sometimes going out and getting uh, second opinions uh, where there's a real, um, uh, uh, where there's a real uh, disconnect between uh, two parties is always a good idea. Um, and, uh, but other than that, uh, that, that can be a tough one to deal with. Um, I have just a, a one more minute left on my uh, uh, screen here, and I don't know if they're going to uh, cut me off right at one o'clock, but uh, I'll try to ask her one or two more questions. Um, so let's see. Uh, here's one here. Uh, what types of ergonomic concerns do you see as most prevalent, and how do you see addressing these? Um, the I think you know a lot of this is uh, is facility and program dependent. Um, you know I would say in uh, in say maybe uh, large or facilities that do large uh, tox studies or toxin safety studies um, uh, uh, where they do uh, you know several hundred animals a day maybe doing IP injections or or pulling it you know lifting and pulling cages and transferring cages and doing weights you know your your uh, uh, things like um, uh, tunnel carpal and things like that can can be a big issue I see I've seen a lot of that um, uh, probably one of the things I've seen that uh, that really is kind of uh, uh, caught my eye recently is the whole lifting thing. Um, uh, as maybe as I get older, I'm starting to become more sensitive to um, uh, I become more sensitive to that as my back gets uh, a little less stronger than it used to be. But I see, and as our employees age, I see a lot of uh, back injuries now, um, not only from just poor lifting technique, but just um, not maintaining good core strength uh, things that could be prevented through uh, early identification and your and maybe some assistance with the health and safety program so um, anyway uh, hopefully that uh, those are the things I think I've seen uh, at least in my experience um, let's see let me uh, let me ask answer one more here um, Let's see, in my facility, we house mice seeded with human tumors. Our biosafety offices insist we soak the cages after bedding is dumped prior to placing them in a pass-through cage washer, which reaches 182 degrees. We have proposed testing the contamination levels on the clean side of the cage washer to show they have been decontaminated. Can you comment? Um, Well, I, I guess um, uh, I, that's a that's a great question and and uh, is uh, pretty complex one in the fact that there's numbers of areas of risk assessment that need to be you know that need, or number of areas that need to be risk assessed. It's it's not just one particular thing. Um, if you're looking at um, uh, you know the the tumor cells, uh, the human tumors, and the animals. Um, you know, is, is do the tumor cells um, are they shed? Are they in the cage? Um, you know, what's the risk there to anyone who comes in contact with them? Um, uh, what are you soaking them in? Have, have you shown that that's effective? If that's a concern, uh, is that really make a difference in um, uh, you know uh, the level of any viable tumor cells that might be in the cage? Um, uh, and, and you know, I, I guess the primary concern here would be how do you address those people if you've already shown, um, if you could show that the cage wash itself um, re eliminates any risk of, of human tumor cells, um, then the question is how are you protecting the people who are putting the um, uh, cages into the cage washer. So uh, that's the part of the risk assessment that may need to be a little more um, in depth to uh, look at what what the risk is to those people and, and how you mitigate it. So um, uh, sorry I don't have a real direct answer for you, but that's, uh, that's probably the way I would approach it. So um, with that, I think I've uh, probably gone over uh, uh, as much as I probably should. I uh, want to thank you all for the great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. 
um, but uh, uh, I certainly appreciate your participation and uh, and uh, the great questions that came in. So I'm going to turn it back over to Brenda and uh, see if she would like to uh, sign us off. Uh, the great questions that came in. So thank you, Dr. Swearingen, for that wonderful presentation. Lots of good questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their participation in today's event, and I would also like to thank our sponsor, the Anderson's Lab Betting Products, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again. Goodbye.